This is the Mathematics Education Podcast from MathEdPodcast.com. Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and with me today I have Dr. Mary Shepard, who's a professor in the Department of Mathematics, Computer Science, and Information Systems at Northwest Missouri State University right here in the state. So, Mary, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Sam. We are going to be talking about Mary's recent article in the Journal of Mathematical Behavior entitled Reading Mathematics for Understanding, From Novice to Expert. Uh, And she wrote that with uh, Carla Van Sand. Mary, before we get to the article, I always like to start by backing up a little bit and uh, just hearing a little bit about your graduate school experience. I am one of those strange people who did not... uh, I'm going to actually back up a little bit before graduate school. Oh, sure. Great. Um, my undergraduate degree is in music performance. Really? So not mathematics, although I had several hours of mathematics. I was attempting to be a double major and didn't finish it. Mm-hmm. I have a master's degree in accounting. And then after about 15 years uh, from my undergraduate degree, I went back to Washington University in St. Louis to get a Ph.D. in mathematics, which I received in 1996. My area there was differential geometry. Mm-hmm. I had not even heard of math education as a research area while I was doing my graduate work because I'm a pure mathematician. Right, wow. So then what was it that led you into some educational pursuits or looking at some learning and some reading comprehension? Uh, My first job post-PhD was at SUNY Potsdam, way up in northern New York. Mm -hmm. And one of the professors that had been there before me but who had still had a large influence on the department was Clarence Stevens. He had a set of what were called guiding principles that were posted all around the department. Wow. And we're talking, I mean, on every wall in every office. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we were exposed to them all around. And I knew that as that was a teaching institution. And I knew that being at a teaching institution, pure math research was going to be a very difficult thing to accomplish especially as like a lone differential geometer up in the middle where there weren't very many people that were doing that type of research, even right. if you were to go to local conferences and things like that. Yeah. So I had decided to go back to graduate school because I really wanted to teach at the college level. All I knew about that was that you needed a Ph.D. Mm-hmm. to be able to teach at a college or university. Mm-hmm. So I really had no clue what it meant to, to do research, to do uh, to do anything, I wanted to be a teacher. Mm-hmm. And so and in the process of this influence from Clarence Stevens, one of his guiding philosophies, or, or part of it, was to teach a student to read mathematics with understanding and enjoyment and free them from the need of a teacher. And that struck a chord with me, so I did a lot of what might be called the scholarship of teaching and learning things when I was first just practicing. How do you get students to read a textbook? And I tried things that people at Potsdam suggested, and I wasn't happy with them. Mm -hmm. Um, You could get a little bit, but I I just didn't feel like I was understanding what the students were doing and why they were doing it. Five years after getting that job, I moved to Northwest Missouri State, where I am now, and I was able to, you might say, pursue an actual research agenda Mm -hmm. using reading as the topic and the more I studied it it was like to me that was what I needed to do I wanted students to be independent of the need of a teacher right and to do that they had to know how to read so I needed to understand how they were reading what they were doing actually when they were reading because most of us will tell you that if you don't force the students to read they won't read they'll look at examples or they'll just listen to the teacher or whatever So it was, what do you do to get them to read? Once they do read, what are they doing when they read? What do they understand? Mm -hmm. Uh, And the original research that I did was to understand what students did when they were reading or to just uh, categorize several of the things that they were doing. Mm -hmm. Most of the students were doing the things they were supposed to be doing, Hmm. uh, but they weren't understanding the material when they got done. Yeah, and reading mathematics in particular, I know there's a lot more that comes into it. It's you know, it's not just text; it's symbols, it's diagrams, it's the logic behind the text, and it's all of these factors as well. 
there's lots of things that it uses the symbols. You don't necessarily read from right to left. You cannot phonetically sound out symbols. Mm -hmm. uh, symbols can be read many different ways. Yeah. Um, you can read left to right, top to bottom, right to left, depending on the types of graphs and things that you're looking at. The ability, and I've probably lost the word for it, the ability to make inferences across sentences, you have to do it very intensely in mathematics reading, right. whereas in uh, general reading, books, history, things like that, there is much, although there's still implications across sentences, you have more than one time to sort of get there. Mm -hmm. In math, brevity, clarity, uh, succinctness is prized. Mm -hmm. So you may only get the one chance to read what it is. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just understanding all of that has been, to me, has been fascinating. Right. And uh, uh, I've just enjoyed working with it and listening to students read, understanding what it is that they're trying to do, understanding their thinking as they're reading what they're doing right, and yeah. how they're getting it. Well, it's definitely a very rich area of inquiry, and it's interesting to hear you say, too, it all, it all kind of spurs from this idea of empowering and enacting students to be independent learners um, yes. so that they, you know, because if they can read and if they can make sense of mathematics from these various texts, I mean, there's just a wealth of information available to them without having to, yeah, rely on the time that they can actually have a mathematician working with them directly right. or teaching them directly. Right, and in it, most most of the students we teach aren't going to go out and be mathematicians, but they may have to go look up stuff, and they need to know how to be able to read mathematical stuff that they're going to have to research in whatever job they're in. Mm -hmm. Sure. You mentioned worked examples. That was one thing that I was kind of interested in going to read your article, because I've always been a little bit fascinated with the role of worked examples in, for instance, school mathematics textbooks. And you mentioned how students will sometimes go right to the worked examples. So I was wondering if that is also one of the motivations in your work to kind of see whether the students are making sense of the exposition or whether they're just going to the worked examples and how that how those play out. When students told me what they did, mm -hmm. they would say, we go to the worked examples. Okay. And what I found as I would work with students, their version of looking at a worked example, it well, at least in my opinion, was not helpful. They would read what a worked example said without ever trying to internalize it to say, why did the author or the person working this do this set of steps? Why, how does that follow from the the exposition that's been before this or that comes after it. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been, I have been, and Carla would probably be on the opposite side of this, so we sometimes have discussions about this when we do it. I don't mind worked examples, but when I tell students to read now when I'm working with them, I say cover up the work. See how much of it you can do without looking at what the author did. Mm -hmm. Push yourself to see what that un your understanding is before you just let the author try and pour it in so that you're not really uh, engaging with the material. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so there's this wide area of phenomenon that you're interested in that you're able to work on now at Northwest Missouri State. And in the Journal of Mathematical Behavior article in Volume 35, the current article, what would you say is the primary goal that that article takes on within this larger body of work? When I did the research that was for this study, it was, I had listened to students for 10 years reading, and so I had a good feel for what a first-year mathematics students do when they read. But I wanted to know what experts did, what mathematicians did, and I was able to uh, get a sabbatical where I could go to Arizona State, where Carla is, mm -hmm. and could actually observe mathematicians. There were enough mathematicians there that would volunteer so that I could actually uh, listen to them, and I gave them a, a a scenario where they would have to act like, in essence, like a student. They were going to be preparing to teach a class they'd never t taught before. Mm. And I wanted to see how they read and what they did and how that was different from what undergraduates do. That was the primary goal. That was the goal that I had set out when I started the study. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, you had some mathematicians involved, kind of a handful of mathematicians. Mm -hmm. You also had some graduate students in mathematics. Right. Could you say uh, just a little bit more about that full population that you had involved? I had I had the graduate students. I used them sort of as a primer to make sure that I was okay mm -hmm. uh, in what I was doing beforehand. It was amazing, though, how much they acted like undergraduates hmm. in how they read 
And there was still significant difference between the graduate students and the mathematicians and how mm-hmm. they read mathematics. Yeah, so that's interesting it was, in it itself. It was very strange. Yeah. 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 And now reading is often a very invisible process. So methodologically, what was your approach to sort of get a glimpse into the invisible process of reading? And I know it's not a really authentic way to do it, but I had what's did uh, read aloud, think aloud. So they were asked to read the passage out loud so I could see how they were hopefully internally verbalizing. But I also asked them uh, any time they thought of something, like if their mind water, wandered off to do something while they were reading, to tell me what they were thinking about. When they worked a problem to uh, attempt to express, to verbalize, what their thought process as they were going through what what uh, whatever work it was they were doing or whatever notes they were taking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then when you you had that data, then you used this really cool tra- uh, like a visual transcription process. So I'll um, invite the listeners to go check out the article, especially Table One, where you kind of lay out these different um, ways that you could take the reading, the thing that they were reading, and then you could mark it up to kind of represent the way that they actually processed it and went through it. Do you want to say a little bit about how you kind of transcribed it in that way? Um, I can tell you how I transcribed it, and I can tell you what I had to do for the article. I'm a very (laughs) visual person, and I did all of it in color when I was doing the actual transcribing. Okay. So I used different colors to represent like the if, things that I came up with. If they like paraphrased it. If the they... paraphrases and the, uh, when, when I called what was called read the meaning where they, there were a set of symbols there and they verbalized something that was the meaning of the symbols but was not anywhere related to the symbols at all. Mm-hmm. They weren't just saying out loud the names of the symbols. They were actually no. just saying like, oh, this basically means... Oh, they wouldn't, that would be almost a paraphrase. They would actually read something and say, okay, if we compose these charts in the right direction, we get the identity maps. Gotcha, yeah. So, yeah, so I had codings for the things. And then if they omitted stuff, if they skipped stuff, mm-hmm. um, stuff, you know, being one of those really intense mathematical words and everything. So, uh, <laughs> But, yeah, there was, I had, uh, it was essentially four sets of coding. If they read something what I would call a non-standard way, but they read the symbols, but they were maybe not quite the way you would have read them. Right. If they paraphrased or uh, read the meaning, if they omitted stuff. Mm-hmm. So there, w- there was a whole whole uh, class of things. Sure. And said. so then for the actual printed article being black and white, it looks like they you, you came up with some nice kind of diagrammatic ways to show right. those different things. Yeah, right. It, yeah, it worked out nicely, and it, it's nice to follow it through then when you're able to share the data in the findings themselves, too. Right. So I'm speaking with Mary Shepard from Northwest Missouri State University about her article, Reading Mathematics for Understanding from Novice to Expert. So if we do go into what you were able to see, what were some of the patterns or what were some of the overall strategies that you saw in your data for reading these mathematical texts? The strategies that the undergraduates used, the first year students used, Mm -hmm. uh, was very much like they had been, what I would say, they had been taught as good reading strategies. You read through, if you don't understand something, you might go back and reread it one time. You might make a little paraphrase of it. You would read the symbols literally symbol by symbol. Uh, You'd make sure you could say everything correctly. You would actually use the tone of your voice would sound like it made sense to you. Mm -hmm. I I was never sure if they were actually, if they were trying to convince themselves that it made sense or or what. Fake it till Um, you make it type of thing. Yeah. (laughs) but mostly they would just read straight through, and they, what they would not do is do what I would call deep, or what Carla also helped, helped me with, would call deep comprehension checks. They would say, like, okay, uh, I got that, but without you, you didn't get the feeling when they were doing it that they really did get it. Hmm. Uh, when the mathematicians read, their comprehension checks were much, much deeper uh, they were able to skim stuff that was very familiar with to them and know exactly what it was. Uh, for instance, there was a metric that was the standard metric in, in Euclidean space. And most of the ma- mathematicians just skimmed right through that because that's something very familiar they've seen, they've taught. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what was surprising was they did not read the symbols symbol for symbol. They literally put meaning in in place of reading the symbols. And it was so automatic, and this will probably sound strange, the first 
mathematician that did this. Uh, I was in the recording session. Carla was outside the door. I ran out the door when it was over. I'm going, Carla, you can't believe this. They didn't read it symbol by symbol. They read the meanings. And so, <laughs> and then I come out, the second one, I say, and I'm thinking, well, this is probably just a fluke. Mm-hmm. The second and the third and the fourth, all four of them did it. Mm-hmm. Only three are recorded in uh, the paper, but all four of them did it. And the fact that that was so significantly different. The other things were things you might expect to happen, I would think, as as readers progress in their ability to read detailed and technical information. But that reading the meaning was the part that, at least for me, struck and said, I need to be teaching different. I need to be teaching my students to not read symbol by symbol, but to read what the actual meaning of those symbols are. Hmm. And just to even realize that that should be a goal. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And how did the, so could you say a little bit more about how the graduate students fit in as well? Like, were they, like you said, um, more similar to the undergraduates in that regard, or, or were they more similar to the undergraduates in other ways? They were similar to the uh, undergraduates in that they were, they tended very much to read the symbols that were there. Mm-hmm. But unlike the undergraduates, they were very willing to spend time trying to make sense out of notation or diagrams or examples that were in the passages that they were reading. There was one place where it was there was a, a composition of maps that essentially, uh, and I, I'm, I hope I don't get too technical here, you have a manifold, you have a map from uh, the manifold to Euclidean space, and then you have an inverse map of that. You can compose them in a certain order, and you get a map from Euclidean space to Euclidean space. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the graduate students spent a long time trying to understand that, to understand what the maps were talking about. The, although I didn't have something similar for the, the undergraduates, the first-year students, they were very unwilling to look even at, say, a graph that was in what they were reading. So they wouldn't even go over and look at a graph. Hmm. Uh, they would sort of just read through the text and without paying attention to anything that was around the hmm. text. Hmm. So that was a big difference. I mean, you could see progression. You could see uh, persistence. Was uh, The graduate students had persistence in reading and persistence in attempting to make sure they had understanding of the material. Right, yeah. I mean, I think that's... It's it's obviously an issue in reading, as you've uncovered in this study, but, I mean, to me that's also a broader issue of students, learners of mathematics, you know, to what extent they're willing to spend the time grappling with something or trying to understand something, or whether students have come to believe that, oh, in mathematics you're supposed to either get it or not get it. If you don't get it right away, then someone is supposed to show you how to do it. Right. Um, so to me, it's it's kind of speaking to a pretty broad issue in mathematics education. I, and I thought it was amazing that it came out in this reading, that that same issue came out in the reading that mm-hmm. co- across the different levels of readers. Right. So overall, if you could kind of uh, boil it down for us as you reflect on this study yourself, what do you see as a key takeaway, like a key idea that comes out of this study for the listeners? For me... Anytime I do this type of research, uh, the takeaway is what I what do I need to be doing in my classroom mm-hmm. to help students in their learning. And for me, the takeaway from this is I need to teach the students to read beyond the symbols, to read into the meaning, and to be able to persist or take time to understand and not to think that reading 10 pages of mathematics should be able to be accomplished in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that if it takes them three hours to read 10 pages, that's good. Mm -hmm. Persistence, uh, I'll forget what the habit of mind is called, but where where they are willing to take that time to to invest time to understand and not, to understand in more than one way, to understand in the sense that you understand what the symbols are so that you understand the meaning that's being said there and the time to take to understand uh, where definitions and how how the different parts of whatever you're reading fit together to make a true sense of what the material, what the author of the material is trying to get across to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, to me, it connects to the idea of productive struggle, I think, from Hebert. Uh, and I, yes. I most often think of productive struggle in terms of problem solving or working on a task with students in a classroom or homework assignments. 
but I think it really applies here as well. If if a student is using a mathematics text and they want to try to learn something, learn some new mathematical ideas from the text, that could be productive struggle as well. That's what I think, yes. And you, you had the, the correct words for it that I never managed to remember. <laughs> sure. No, I think that's great. And so do you, uh, currently in your teaching, have you come up with some specific strategies that you're kind of employing to try to help the students see these um, goals? They will tell you that, my students will tell you that I'm, uh, I'm really hard about this, hard on them. Uh, what I do, I actually give my students for every single section a reading guide and I work with it in the reading guide, which tells them, read this much. Now you need to pay attention to this. You need to try this. Make sure you do this example. Cover it. And I also give them, when you get to this, when you get to these symbols, here are ways to read it. Remember what the meaning is that you're reading. So, mm-hmm. for instance, uh, and I think this is in the paper, when they see an infinity symbol in a limit, I ask them to read this as, say, growing without bound, instead of saying the limit as X goes to infinity. Mm-hmm. So, so that they're using some meaning yeah. uh, and not trying to read the symbol, symbol for symbol. Right. So I actually work with that when they speak in class. I also ask them to speak with that same uh, meaning as opposed to using uh, straight using the symbols when they, they speak. Right, yeah, that makes sense. My guest is Mary Shepard from Northwest Missouri State University. We've been discussing her article in JMB, Reading Mathematics for Understanding from Novice to Expert. And Mary, I have one last question that I ask all my guests. Uh, and so you mentioned kind of a, a diverse background, including music and accounting and ma- pure mathematics and now some mathematics teaching and learning type things. So I'm very curious what you're going to say to this. But <laughs> if, if you were not in mathematics and in mathematics education, what would you see yourself doing instead? I- when when you sent me this question, I'm going, I'm not in mathematics education. Of course I am, but I don't <laughs> think of myself as that. Sure, yeah. I, I truly think of myself as a mathematician mm-hmm. who is very interested in student learning. So I've, I've worked very hard to try and, and figure out within the undergraduate math education research group how, how you do these types of things. Right. But be that as it may, I would be... I have two things that I'd be. One of them is, of course, I would probably be a musician. If I were good enough to be a professional musician, I would be a professional musician. Mm-hmm. And w- I still play. I still perform. I was going to say, so, yeah, so are you an instrumentalist? Or? I am an instrumentalist. I play clarinet, and I play clarinet well. I play violin a little bit. <laughs> so uh, Yeah, I'm kind um, of that way. I play piano pretty well. I play guitar sort of for fun. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of that. that's sort of it, yeah, so... But I also, although this hasn't come across in anything else, I am also a very avid cross-stitcher, counted cross-stitcher, and I've done quite a bit of work on the mathematics behind symmetry patterns and such like and demonstrating that in cross-stitch. And I've learned to design stuff. So one of my goals or one of my dreams is that I would own a store where I was designing and selling and working with people in counted needlework. Wow. Huh. That's an interesting one. It still has some mathematical connections, but definitely from a little bit different angle than usual. Well, um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. This was great talking to you about it, and uh, thank you very much also for your work in the study. Well, thank you, Sam. I'm just amazed that somebody would actually think that they want to listen to this study I've only had a couple of things published, so the fact that this is chosen for something I, is uh, it, it's flattering to me. Oh, no, so. absolutely. Uh, and I do really encourage the listeners to check it out because, they're, like I said, the, the diagramming that you're able to do of the reading is actually pretty cool to see, and it might give people ideas for their own analysis as well. So I encourage people to look at those figures that you include in the article. Well, thank you, Sam. Thank you for listening to this episode of the MathEd Podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast financially, please use the PayPal donation button at mathedpodcast.com.